innovators, I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridge in the Gap podcast presented by Applied Software. You're invited to join our MEP and construction innovation adventure with the mission to propel this great industry forward. My guest today is Chris Brenchley. He is a digital evangelist for nearly three decades and is the co-founder and CEO of SureHand, an industrial talent sourcing platform provider and the driving force behind the Rock the Trades workforce development movement. He is deeply committed to expanding awareness of blue collar paths, reducing industrial labor shortages and ending underemployment. Welcome to the show, Chris. Hey, Todd. So good to be here. Thanks for having me on today. Absolutely. Excited for the conversation today. So I always like to begin with how you found your way into the construction industry. You know, it's interesting. As you said, I've been in digital for over three decades. And within that uh, period of time had been focused primarily in sort of the ed tech space, really, uh, and in my case, primarily in uh, adult learning and e-learning and really helping adult working professionals um, of all color professions, really, uh, find fulfillment and and success and so on. And I actually found my way into the trades through Surehand, actually. I I, uh, was part of a business incubation cycle uh, sponsored by uh, the good folks at Stanley Black and Decker back in, in 2017. And that was really, that, that, uh, that incubation served as the uh, genesis for the company that has since become Surehand. So other than, you know, working for uh, a house painter back in my college days uh, and, and, you know, wrenching on cars in my free time, something I like to do, uh, this, this sure hand journey was really what brought me into the, into the trades and really the industrial sector. Yeah. Interesting. Well, what was a surprise in coming in and getting exposure to the trades? I think, you know, I, I would say, uh, and probably a lot of what we're going to talk about given the topic, you know, I, I think one of the big surprises for me and, you know, with sure hand, we started out in energy. We've since expanded into uh, the manufacturing space. And, you know, as we make the turn in the 2022, we'll expand further into, you know, construction, heavy civil commercial construction. Uh-huh. And, and I think what I'd say surprised me the most is just the advances in technology, you know, technology is hard and soft used in these industries, you know, mm-hmm. and how the sort of nature of the jobs have become much more technical software and other technologies play such a a larger role um, in these industries that I think people are aware of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm more than agree with that. I, it's funny, you know, when I tell people about this show and that, that I host it for those that are outside the industry, they're like, you're doing a podcast around technology and innovation with construction and MEP, like that, do they have that much tech? And you're like, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. You would, your mind would be blown with how much tech there is in the space right now and more coming in all the time. Yeah, I look, it's, it's definitely a greenfield space. I mean, you see it, um, you know, and, and even with all those advancements in that energy and investment in technology and construction, you know, when you look at construction and agriculture, these are industries that have traditionally lagged in, in technology adoption. So I think the advancement um, and increased energy and investment in those, in, uh, in those sectors or industries with technology it has been significant and it's really seems to be accelerating at least from our vantage point yeah so from that vantage point how would you describe the state of the trades today uh well i mean look as it relates to the workforce and you know and really the focus of what we're doing with rock the trades is you know we're in a we're in a moment in time i think it's a fairly unique moment in time where we're coming off you know, we're essentially emerging from a global pandemic that has affected, you know, almost every industry and every person in your audience uh, to varying degrees. Um, you have, uh, you know, renewed um, uh, interest and investment and focus on, you know, this country's infrastructure. Um, but at the same time, you have this big crew change, right? Where you have the baby boomer generation by 2030 is going to be aging out of the workforce across all professions. But when you look at uh, the skilled trades in particular, um, you know, they the baby boomer generation has held a uh, much higher percentage of those jobs 
compared to other industries. Like if you look at the, the median age, you know, Bureau of Labor Statistics, if you look at the median age of, you know, a con person who works in the construction trades, for example, is mid forties. If you look at the median age of a software engineer, it's 27. And so that's a, that's a very stark gap. And so, you know, I, I think this is, this is why we believe now is the right time for Rock the Trades, the initiative, and, and really the rallying cry to make people aware of this situation. So I don't think there's ever been a time where there's been more opportunities to build a great career with great learning potential and professional fulfillment um, than any time, in, at least as long as I've been in the workforce the last 30 years. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think is needed then to, to really turn the, the tide on maybe the, the misconception of the trades in order to kind of break through that, that noise and get the message out to different audiences and get them exposure to the industry? Yeah, well, look, I, I think one of the, there's a few things we're kind of poking at with Rock the Trades. I think the first is, in addition to the factors I just talked about, you know, there's been this relentless prevailing narrative over the last 30, some will say 50 years that has undervalued vocational training, what's now called career technical education, union apprenticeships, with this you know, four-year college degree by default or college first mindset, right? And mm -hmm. you know, over that period of time, culturally, you know, the trades, the blue collar career paths have had you know, a bit of a stigma attached to them, to be honest. And you know, that is something, you know, everything from, well, the trades are for kids who can't hack college, or you know, the trades are for folks that like working with their hands, you know, those expressions start to get ingrained in kind of our, our culture. And, and I think that that cultural societal um, uh, narrative is something that's been really damaging. And then it gets ex exacerbated by, you know, uh, I remember coming up, I'll date myself, I'm my early 50s, right? But I remember coming up in, in high school in the mid 80s, you know, I, I had a uh, high wood shop. I had plastics like shop class in mm -hmm. schools, you know, they're just, they're just, they're not there anymore. Right. And so, you know, the younger generations just haven't had that early imprinting or exposure to, I think the fulfillment that comes from building and making, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's sort of lost. It's, you know, it's, it's, again, I just think it's sort of lost its way. Um, and I think the other thing too, and I, I mentioned at the top is, you know, I think the notion of changing the perception of these as dirty jobs and, and things that are, you know, with, with all the technology and all the advancements in safety, that starts to open up the possibility to bring new and maybe unexpected entrants into the trades in construction and manufacturing. You know, you start to get into diversity inclusion and other topics there. But again, I think it's it really comes down to elevating the perception of the skilled tradespeople back to the industrial artists that they were, you know, decades ago. Mm -hmm. well, what do you think went wrong, if I can put it that way, on the perception of the trades? Where did it really kind of start to, to veer off and construction kind of fall out of being the uh, a cool kind of worthwhile career path to go into? <laughs> I, again, I think there's a lot of drivers, but I, you know, one one part of our hypothesis is, you know, when I think about um, the early 2000s, right, the dawn of the internet era and digital jobs, and you know, the first dot com era. You know, I came up, I was in my mid 20s when that happened, so you know, I, I, the fortune of timing, and and uh, and again, I should also point out that. There's nothing wrong with going to college. There's nothing wrong with you know four-year degrees or going into a white-collar profession. It's just not the best fit starting point for everyone. But I think the pendulum swung so far toward sort of the the cool, sexy jobs to have were you know in Silicon Valley with a Google or a Facebook or your coder or your whatever. And again, those are great jobs too, or can be. But I, I think there was just this huge overcorrection, and when you combine that with the fact that again, kids in school aren't getting exposed to the trades at that young age. Mm -hmm. And when you start to look at social media and you start to look at YouTube and TikTok and Instagram, and you know, really the the channels through which uh, millennials, Gen Z, you know, the, the younger generations are consuming their content, 
um, it, you know, in those early days, there just wasn't that much emphasis put on the skilled trades. And, and that's one of the kind of core, I think, um, components of the Rock the Trades initiative is we're really turning the camera around and, and training the lens on those skilled industrial trades people, the industrial artists, as I said, um, you know, and putting them out there as shining examples of like, hey, this is what uh, a cool, successful and fulfilling career in the trades looks like. Like to, mm-hmm. this, it puts the face on the industry or the career path. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. So you kind of were tapping on it just there a bit, but how do you combat the mentality that the the trade schools are for those that can't handle or can't do college instead of being the trade schools are, you know, very valid. There are rewarding options for many kids coming out of, of college. You know, I, I think there's some people that, that kind of give the lip service to the trade schools of, yeah, you know, it's great, but maybe not for my kid. How do you combat that mentality? Yeah, listen, I, I, you know, and I use this expression all the time, which is there, there'd be no white collar world without blue collar workers, right? So this, this podcast we're doing today via Zoom and all the, you know, the audio tech we've got, you know, skilled, tra- skilled trades people were involved in making this podcast possible. Mm-hmm. Folks pulling fiber along railroad tracks for the internet and so on. So I, I think it starts with this acceptance or realization that we all share an all collar imperative to elevate the trades in the way that I'm, I'm describing. And so, so number one, I think it starts with that awareness, really being deeply mindful of the role, the critical role that the skilled trades, again, across energy, manufacturing, construction, and you know, there's service trades as well. We, we heard a lot about essential workers uh, last year in 2020. Our focus is on the, more of the industrial trades but really an awareness and a mindfulness of the importance of, the, of those uh, jobs and career paths and the hardworking folks who build, operate, and maintain the world around us. So I think it starts with awareness. I think the second thing component is information, right? And so much of this you know, prevailing narrative is fueled by these ideas. Well, if you, wanna, if you wanna make a lot of money in your career, your professional life, you have to go down a white collar career path. Um, and in order to do that, you have to go to college and you probably go into debt or you put your parents in debt. And, you know, the, there couldn't be a more sort of patently false uh, comment than that. And, uh, you know, we, we run into uh, highly successful uh, tradespeople every single day and successful in terms of career fulfillment, but earnings potential, right? And there's dozens of studies out there that compares like, you know, let's say Jane went to IBW, got into a five-year electrical apprenticeship program, earns while she learns, doesn't take on a ton of debt. And you look at, you know, as she becomes a journeyman and a master electrician, you look at her earnings potential compared to like Jimmy goes in the debt, goes, gets a four-year degree, probably a five-year degree, by the way, uh, graduates. Uh, and I, I just saw a recent study from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where they did a study of recent college graduates, almost half, 41% of those graduates ended up working in a field or in a job that didn't require that degree, right? Mm-hmm. And then you compound the problem by, again, looking at that student loan burden. And, you know, there's $2 trillion in outstanding student loan debt in this country. And uh, you know, uh, 30 some, 35% of it, like $600 million um, is uh, held by uh, my generation. So that's a lifelong debt burden that people are dealing with. So, I mean, when I'm out there talking rock the trades and I'm throwing out statistics like this to white collar audiences or all collar audiences, that's where the light bulb starts to go off right so Mm -hmm. so again it starts with awareness i think you followed up with really good information and i think the last piece of it is in addition to sort of putting those influencers out there the folks we call rockers as shining examples of a a great career and life in the trades um, it's also about lighting the trailhead right getting into the trades is not a well-lit path right when we talk to trades people pick a trade doesn't matter well, how'd you become a plumber or an electrician or a welder or you know an industrial inspector? And I, I can't even tell you how many times that answer is, well, my brother's sister's buddy's pal introduced me to it. 
uh, you know, and, and it's all these really great offline intimate sort of interactions. And that's great, but that doesn't scale, right? That doesn't, right. you know, that keeps the bubble really small and closed off. And so I agree with you. I think for us to really make a dent at this, uh, it's not about the blue collar households. We celebrate those folks. We celebrate the tradespeople, the people who are already doing the work out there. But it's about, again, as you said, how do we, how do we sort of expand the message, take that, take that message and push it into the, the white collar world or an all collar um, uh, perspective that's going to really make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think, you know, you just called out some of the, those stats. The, the stats are pretty staggering on the cost of college versus their earning potential of the trades. It's kind of mind blowing to me that it seems, you know, you, you see a lot of, on LinkedIn of people in the trades calling that out, but it doesn't seem like it has really broken out into the greater public awareness and in, in that sphere yet, which is, is mind-blowing and, and frustrating <laughs> for, for me dealing with all, all the trades and having these conversations over again. It's like, well, this seems so obvious. How, why is it not getting, getting out there more? Um, so what kind of movement do you think, and you mentioned with Rock the Trades, uh, what, what kind of movement do you think is really required to get that informational piece out there and, and wake the, the greater public up? Yeah, I think I think I think waking up is a great way to put it, uh, Todd. I think the so the so I said the sort of the one thing we were poking at was that relentless narrative. The other aha moment that again was really part of the genesis of the Rock the Trades initiative that we've stood up is that as I started thinking about or we started thinking about the problem more, we realized that you know over the last five, 10, 20 years, um, as you suggest, by the way, this isn't a secret problem. This issue has been around for a long time, right? It's been it's been slowly or getting worse over time, but it's not new. It's not like we're the only ones calling all these things out. And it occurred to me that when you look at uh, the various entities that have spent the last couple of decades attacking this problem with time, energy, money, smarter people than me going after it, whether it's federal, state, local government programs, uh, programs led by employers or corporates or brands, industry associations um, uh, like NECA, for example, um, uh, UA, labor unions, IBEW, you know, you take all those sort of uh, labor industry, professional society type organizations, trade schools, community colleges, and so on. Uh, the, one, the one aha we had, I think was probably the most important one is for all the programs that are out there driven by those entities, and they're all really important, we need more, not less, they're all inherently siloed off mm -hmm. by definition. They're focused on a given industry or a specific trade in a region or a specific community or cohort within that community. And what happens is all those initiatives get their brands and their messages, right? Um, and they start to, to collide with one another, it creates a lot of dissonance, a lot of noise out there. Everybody gets the stats right. But when they come at it from a marketing standpoint, right? Because this is a perception issue. Mm -hmm. Those those brands start to collide. And so what we're trying to do with Rock the Trades, and, and it's and we didn't actually set out to do this exactly. We thought this potential might be there, and, and you know, having stood this up in April, given the momentum we've got in bringing on you know new uh, influencers or rockers, industry partners whom we call roadies, Surehand being the first roadie. Um, it's been pretty remarkable how everyone has leaned in to the expression rock the trades as this rallying cry around this issue. Mm -hmm. And so it became pretty clear to me that the one of the things that was missing is the, you know, you, you probably remember the got milk campaigns from the dairy board. Right? Sure. Everybody starts thinking about, oh, I need to have a glass of milk because of that. Uh, or I go back to the 80s, date myself a little, and you think, you know, just say no to drugs. Nancy, Ra uh, Nancy Reagan era. Yeah, campaign. That was a meme before the internet was even around, right? You know, there's just a ton of different, um, you know, expressions and movements and issues out there. And I'm not drawing any sort of comparison across those issues. However, those simple constructs, those visceral rallying cries really allow or allowed organizations and individuals to understand the issue, onboard it. And, and, and again, that sort of harmony, um, uh, that really gets us to signal. And when you get the signal and you start to combat all that noise from a marketing standpoint, we think we can really elevate this issue into the national consciousness in the way that it needs to be done.
but it has to be a Big Ten initiative. Surehand mm -hmm. can't do it alone. Um, and from the very beginning, we knew we were developing something that was meant to be given back to industry, onboarded, and pushed out into the wild so that we can, you know, at least help uh, raise awareness of, of these issues and, and what it means to our country. Mm -hmm. I more than agree. I think it, one of the cool things over the last couple of years has been the uh, increase in kind of these different voices and, and thought leaders popping up in the space talking about this message. And that's fantastic to see. But without the cohesion between all of them and it kind of linking arms together and pushing forward in the same direction, it creates this kind of scattered approach to it, which isn't going to really drastically move the needle the way we need it to. So uh, I think the, the movement is fantastic of bringing people together across the industry, linking arms together and saying, all right, let's go tack this together. And we have this kind of one rallying cry that we can all get behind. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, a real simple example, like in the real world, it's like, you know, you go to a, a sporting, you go, let's say you go catch a football game, right? NFL game, college game, doesn't matter. And when you get the entire sort of home crowd chanting defense or, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. like, I mean, that's a very simple example of the power of how loud that message can get, right? And so this is really what we're trying to do. And, and I think doing it in a way that is authentic and genuine. So when we look for our rockers, our influencers, these are not paid ambassadors. These are not brand ambassadors. They're doing it because they're proud of the work they do. They're committed to the trades. Um, but they also are sort of master content creators out on the various social media channels out there, networks out there. So whether it's YouTube, whether it's Instagram, whether it's TikTok, um, this is where the action is. This is where certainly the younger generations are consuming their content and consuming it in a very different way than the way I or even you probably consumed information as you were coming up. So I think the other thing that's really important is you have to communicate this message uh, in, in the places and in the manner in which those, uh, those audiences um, are accustomed to, to hearing them. And, you know, think of, think of back to when you were in middle or high school. I didn't listen to my parents or my guidance counselor or my teachers all the time. They weren't necessarily the ones that were influencing me in what I wanted to do. And in my case, in many ways, if my parents told me to do something, I'd do the exact opposite thing. Whether it was good, bad, or indifferent for me, it didn't matter. <laughs> and so this is why, again, turning the lens around on these influencers, these rock stars, these rockers in the trades, mm -hmm. We feel is an opportunity to inspire, you know, again, today's youth, folks coming out of military service and want to take those skills they learned in the military and apply them uh, in the civilian world. Uh, folks coming out of the correctional system, white collar folks, just jaded being on Zooms all day um, and, and, you know, who'd be more fulfilled making something, fixing something. Um, you know, I, I think that's that's kind of how it all comes together. Yeah, that's awesome. Can you dive into some of the, the stories of the rockers that have, have come on, you know, what kind of stories do they yeah, look I mean, like? I, what are I they? think a hundred percent. So a uh, few things, one, our first rocker, our number one rocker is Barbie, the welder. I don't know if you know Barbie, the welder, Yeah, but she's an absolute force of nature. And we, we caught up probably about a year ago. We just connected on LinkedIn and I, we were just hatching this idea called rock the trades. And I, I realized that, you know, in the spirit of, you know, making things, you, you know, doing a few things, underscoring that this, these are industrial artists, two, making it cool and exciting and, and cinematic in many ways, um, the work that these folks are doing or that experience, right? To get that sort of across the, the screens, whether it's right. a computer or a phone screen. Um, we commissioned Barbie to uh, create a, a sculpture, a light, what turned out to be a life-size um, sculpture of a tradesman and we crowdsource vintage tools from Barbie's followers from across America that have been incorporated into those into the sculpture. She thought it was going to take her like three months when she started. She's still at it. I expect we'll be done in December. You can follow her on, on Instagram or TikTok and see the project in, in process. But it's been pretty amazing to start off with uh, Barbie as our first ambassador. Her narrative, she started out um, as an uh, auto mechanic got into welding, 
uh, you know, just as a, as a profession in terms of an industrial welder and then has since become uh, a, a metal art sculptor. But her, her narrative is fascinating and you can read it on Rock the Trades. But, you know, she came up, she wasn't someone who knew what she wanted to do in high school, had some serious hard knocks coming up um, in life and, and just really has found such deep fulfillment uh, being a welder and then turning that, turning that career as a, as a commercial welder an industrial welder into becoming truly an industrial artist was a great place to start. Um, but anyway, when you look at our other rockers that we're pulling on, we're trying to bring on um, a, a really good combination of uh, faces and narratives and folks that you would expect, those that are unexpected. Um, and again, I think that's when you start to show the, the various backgrounds, the, you know, a very diverse group of individuals, whether it's diverse, diversity through gender or ethnicity, or again, backgrounds. Like we have folks that have come in and have college degrees, wanted to be a psychologist or go into the medical field, for example, who, just, who took a, a right turn and decided, no, I, I did that for a little bit. I'd, I'd actually rather do this and go work in a career in the trades. I think the more of those unexpected, authentic and compelling narratives we can get out there, the, the more we can generate a lot of excitement and most importantly, do it uh, in a way that reaches that all collar audience, you know, blue collar folks, the white collar folks and everybody in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that you're coming at it through the, the storytelling element. Cause I think those, those stories and the, the narrative that's around them is so much more powerful and, and speaks way more than just citing out the statistics. Cause a lot of times statistics are, are great. I'm, I'm a stats guy. I love stats, but they can fall flat a lot of times too, and just become numbers that aren't really relatable, but the, the story element can, that's what is, is powerful and really grips people. Well, and, and you know, and, and I think you're starting to see this thankfully pervade entertainment and media, that realm as well. You know, you look at shows like Forged in Fire, Tough as Nails. There's a lot of YouTube shows out there starting to pop up mm -hmm. that are, you know, in a very similar fashion, um, really celebrating the skilled trades and showing um, the real talent and the commitment and the fulfillment that can come from working, uh, you know, uh, embarking on those career paths and doing that work over time. So again, my hope is that we can continue, uh, you know, honing the message, uh, getting more and more rockers and roadies adopting the rock, the trades rallying cry. And again, we just recently brought on American welding society, uh, American society for non-destructive testing, um, Olympus, as a corporate, um, Stanley Black & Decker, they've been a tremendous supporter of ours from day one. Um, and so as you start to see these organizations weave this rock the trades into their narratives, um, I, I think you'll see the, the volume amplify because uh, I think I'll put it very simply. Um, most, most of the organizations out there, particularly corporates and brands, but even industry associations, um, uh, workforce development, and or marketing, um, but certainly workforce development is not their core competency, particularly companies and, and brands. And rather than have all these brands out there or these companies invest in standing up their own version of a rock the trades, the message, the narrative, the marketing, it's like focus on your core capability, join in the rock the trades movement, become part of this big 10 initiative. And it's gonna be more cost effective for you as a business. And what's amazing is we're starting to see uh, our rockers come together and engage with one another on social media. We're seeing our roadie partners start to engage in new and different ways as they've gotten involved uh, with the mission and the initiative. And so I think that just that just makes the big tent uh, of Rock the Trades a much more a much more beneficial place to be as either a rocker or a roadie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So how do people step up then and join the movement? Uh, it's really easy. Honestly, there are a variety of ways you can get involved. Um, Rockthetrades.com is the place to start. I can learn more about uh, what we're up to with the initiative. You can certainly follow us on Instagram uh, or LinkedIn. Those are the two primary social channels we're focused on right now. We really want to do those right before uh, mm -hmm. expanding. Um, and then, you know, as an organization or uh, who might want to become a roadie, you know, we keep it really simple. Like this isn't like a 
there's not a lot of friction in getting involved with the mission, not a lot of legal, uh, there's no financial commitment out of the gate. We're really just asking people to embrace the message, become one of our roadies, announce that they're an official Rock the Trades roadie. And then what we do is we work with those organizations and depending on their size, their reach, their marketing programs, we work with them to find ways to pull that message into their narrative. Um, we've had brands uh, like DeWalt, for example, uh, back in September, we ran Rock the Trades on the number 20 DeWalt car in the Richmond Federated Auto Parts 400. Nice. Um, which was cool. And, you know, and, and, you know, that's just an example of a brand like DeWalt, you know, uh, leaning in to rock the trades and helping again, amplify that message. Um, and we're seeing interest from other brands to do similar. Um, and then I, I would say, lastly, whether you're an individual or an organization, we also stood up the rock the trade scholarship program, uh, this summer, we, we seed funded the first cohort, uh, for $2,500 awards. Uh, but we've already raised 5X that for the 2022 cohorts, uh, and we're pushing the, to uh, 10X that for next year. So I think you'll see that start to grow, but there's certainly an opportunity to contribute to the scholarship fund. Every dollar donated ends up in the hands of someone who is uh, enrolled in a trade school or getting a, you know, a two-year degree, let's say, at a community college in a trade. Um, we fund all administrative costs working with our not nonprofit partner scholarship America. So it's important to underscore that all those monies go into the hands of you know, those that need it. Yeah. I love that. Uh, and on the Surehand side, how do people find out more information on what you guys are doing? Surehand.com. Yeah. So Surehand, the company, as I said, we're, we're primarily in the energy and manufacturing industries today. What we're going to push into construction in 2022 uh, but surehand.com is the best place to engage uh, at, or, or learn more. And, and, and we're pretty heavy out there on LinkedIn as well. So another good place to engage with uh, the company is uh, are those two sites. Nice. Uh, so kind of pivoting to the, the last couple of questions here are one of our main themes on the show is around innovation. So kind of with that in mind, if you could innovate one thing in the industry, what would you innovate? Uh, I think, well, and this is, I'm a little biased because this is kind of part of what we're centered on, but I mean, I think a really important uh, area to focus on is uh, data as it relates to skills, right? You're seeing a huge shift in the tech world and the white collar world around sort of the skills first hiring mindset, right? A lot of great initiatives happening out there. So it's not so much about someone's past experiences or their resume or, you know, where did they go to college kind of thing. It's really focused on what's their aptitude, interests, their skills that they can bring into a given uh, role. I think, I think the opportunity to do that in the uh, industrial sector, in construction, in manufacturing, in energy is a real opportunity because that can, that can remove a lot of friction from you know, connecting uh, work to workers and vice versa. So I, I think that would be a great, there's so many advances happening out in the field um, you know, with prefab and other additive manufacturing technologies, but so much of what happens in the workforce world today is driven by data. So I think that, you know, the degree that we can center, you know, the talent ecosystem on really good, normalized, um, and current, you know, professional data skills information on the workforce is a huge opportunity, uh, really for any industry, but certainly in uh, heavy industry. Yeah, absolutely. So what does innovation mean to you? You know, it's not just technical, it's not just technology, you know, I mean, obviously innovation is really tied to tech often uh, and the things that you see, but I mean, there's so many innovations that happen out there uh, on a daily basis, right? You know, you see innovations in marketing, you see innovations in business models. And I think to me, innovation is about really taking a risk um, and coming at solving a problem with a beginner's mindset, being really wide open to the possibility of how a particular problem or situation can be resolved. To me, that's really at, kind of at the core of innovation. And, and I think the only other important ingredient uh, is failure. You also have to be willing to fail and from that failure, iterate 
and iterate and fail and iterate. And then you, you do that enough, you end up getting to this place where you've actually innovated, you've solved the problem. And so I, I think it's a combination of all those factors, at least from my vantage point. And it, and it doesn't require bits and bytes and code and you know AI or robotics. I mean, again, I think there's everyday innovations in every industry that if we just kind of thought about coming at how we solve those problems differently, uh, everyone would be an everyday innovator. So, yeah, I agree. It's a, it's a mindset of continual improvement. Innovation is never one giant leap forward. It's always the combination of these tiny little small adjustments that you make. I fully agree. hundred percent. Well, Chris, thanks so much for coming on the show and, and helping us rock the trades. I love it. Thanks for having me, Todd. Really appreciate your support. And yeah, I welcome your audience. Check us out, rockthetrades.com. Awesome. Love it.